Coming up on DTNS, Twitter has an interesting new way to get money, why Amazon is fighting with Visa in public, and Apple's car roadmap becomes clear. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, November 18th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Austin, Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm Roger Chambers, show's producer. There's a longer version of this show where we talk about things like, why do people lie about how tall they are? Uh, it's called Good Day Internet. Get that at patreon.com slash DTNS. Big thanks to our top patrons. Today they include Scott Hepburn, Bjorn Andre, and Jeff Wilkes. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. On NVIDIA's earnings call, the company disclosed that the Federal Trade Commission expressed concerns about its planned acquisition of ARM, which was in discussions about remedies to address those concerns. The UK and European Commission have both launched investigations into the deal. In Q3, NVIDIA earned $1.17 per share on revenue of $7.1 billion. That's up 50% on the year and beat, beat analyst ex expectations. Just beat, him. Just take that, analyst Just estimates. Beat, beat him to a pulp. Nreal, which is spelled N-R-E-A-L, will begin selling its mixed reality glasses called Light in the United States. They launched in South Korea last year, and now they're available in the U.S. They project 3D images using micro OLED screens, and then they have outward-facing cameras so you can see the real world. So they do augmented reality, not just virtual reality. Has a 53-degree field of view, which may sound small, but it's actually fairly big for mixed reality. Weighs 106 grams, not too heavy. Starting November 30th, 20 Verizon stores will start selling the devices for 599 bucks with online sales starting December 2nd. So one of those weird situations where you can get them in store before you can get them online. The headset... Uh, the set headset rather requires a connected Android phone. Nreal recommends either a OnePlus 8 or one of the more recent Samsung Galaxy phones for the best experience. Although apparently you can use them with an iPhone, uh, according to Engadget. In Android, though, you can use Nreal's Nebula software to access Android apps without taking the glasses off. Spotify rolled out its real-time lyrics feature globally, available to both free and premium users across iOS, Android, on the desktop, consoles, smart TVs, across the board. The company claims that lyrics are available for 8 million titles, for over 8 million titles, in fact. Besides viewing lyrics, users can also share lyrics from songs on social media. Starbucks has partnered with Amazon to open a store called Starbucks Pickup with Amazon Go in Midtown Manhattan on 59th Street between Park and Lex. Barista-made drinks still need to be ordered on the Starbucks app. That part isn't part of the system, but for other items, customers can either scan their palm if they're registered with Amazon One or use a credit card or code from the Amazon app. The store will have sandwiches and salads, stuff you get from Starbucks, but also things from Essa Bagel, Magnolia Bakery, Dominic Ansel. There will also be bodega items like gum and protein bars. And once you have your items, you can sit down in a seating area and enjoy your coffee or just walk out because it's not just a Starbucks. It's also an Amazon Go. No cashier necessary. Second location is planned to open later in the New York Times building. Magnolia Bakery is kind of fancy. Mm -hmm. Or was, anyway, last time I was in New York. One of the longest-running drone delivery companies, Zipline, is bringing its service to the U.S. for the first time. Customers in a 50-mile radius across uh, around Pea Ridge, Arkansas. <laughs> Shout out to Pea Ridge. If you're there, let us know. We'll be given a selection of thousands of health and wellness products. So, after Aspirin, Band-Aids, cotton balls, that sort of stuff that you would maybe get from, from, a, from a Walmart, sent from Walmart to their house. If you're in Pea Ridge and you want to try it, you can download the Zipline app, and they are limiting the number of customers at the start. So you might be on a wait list. You might get in, but we would love to know your experience if you're in the area. Zipline still, I mean, it's slow progress, but still seems like the leading drone delivery company in the world. They've, they've been doing this for years in Rwanda and Ghana and all over the place. So go P Ridge. All right, let's talk a little more about Apple cars. We got something, we got something good this time though, I think. I hope so. We have been talking about the rumored Apple car and what it would look like and what it would entail and how much is it going to be Apple branded and all of those things. Well, today, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman sources told the publication that Apple has completed much of the core work on a new processor for an autonomous electric car. The report says it's in the most advanced component developed for Apple's Project Titan so far. Supposedly, Apple will begin testing the chip in autonomous vehicles in California soon. No official date, but 
soon. The sources also say that the vehicle wouldn't have a steering wheel. It would be compatible with the CCS charging standard and is aimed at launching in 2025. Apple apparently hasn't decided its business model for the car just yet. Yeah, a lot of people were thinking it would be lightning charger, but no, it'll be CCS. That's good to know. Um, I, I, I know there's been a lot of like, what is Apple doing? They keep firing people and hiring people and changing their mind. And Apple hasn't actually ever announced anything. So this is just us kind of looking through a glass darkly at a R and D project. And that's what R and D projects do. You usually just don't see them covered in the press like this. So to me, I feel like. This explains a lot. They were working on the chip. They were focused on the chip. And all this other stuff that's been going on around it was people trying to adapt. Like, well, if the chip can do this, maybe we do this, maybe we do that. And that's what all the changing was. And now that the chip is ready, I feel like it's going to come into focus. Like, all right, this is what it's capable of. And we've made a chip, as we know Apple can, that can do stuff that other car chips can't. So let's get it out of the road, start safety testing it, putting it through its paces, refine our business model. I've... 2025 is pretty ambitious, uh, you know, for your timeline when you're just now getting the chip set. But maybe all that moving around of parts in the over the past 10 years will pay off and they'll be able to hit that date. I don't know. I, I doubt it. And and quite honestly, I think that the idea of us following this R&D uh, process is kind of fruitless. I, I, I would be a little bit more pessimistic than you are, Tom, in the idea that once they have the chip, now everything else is going to fall into, into place. A car is not a laptop. It is not a phone. It is not a, a tablet of some kind. It is a very complex uh, piece of machinery and something that needs to go through a lot more rigor and testing than a, a consumer electronics device is. So yes, a chip would likely be an advantage for Apple should they move into this market, but I think that there are still a million miles between here and there if we are talking about a launch in 2025. Yeah, I, I, the first thing I thought when I read the story was like, okay, cool. It, it seems like <laughs> there is an Apple car in the works in some form, but then, it's sort of like, okay, we perfected the chip. Okay, well, how is the chip going to be mass produced? Because there's a big chip shortage. And maybe Apple has figured out something in some secretive chip building place somewhere on Mars. But probably not. <laughs> and, you know, how, 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 do, how does 2025 make a lot of sense? Unless, honestly, who knows? Maybe, maybe by 2023, we'll all, we'll all laugh about the chip shortage, you know, and everything will have bounced back. But I kind of doubt it. I, also, one, 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 one last thing about this, uh, I think where autonomous cars are now and how we think of them are in a lot different place than when we start, first started hearing rumors about, about the Apple car. I mean, a lot of these major companies have kind of moved away from the idea that autonomous vehicles and self-driving stuff are going to be at least full autonomy that you would require without a steering wheel is something that is like right around the corner. So I don't know. I, I have been both of you pessimistic. Un unbelieving, thinking we're overcovering this this Apple story, uh, but I don't know why. This is the one where I'm like, sure, you're absolutely right, Justin. It's going to take a lot more than a chip to build a car, but Apple's had a lot of time to build those relationships. They're not going to build this car, whether it's Hyundai or somebody else. That's who's going to bring in the expertise. I still think you're right. That makes 2025 pretty ambitious, but that that part I think they may have an, have a line on figuring out, and they're not going to do it all themselves. And Sarah, I do think by 2023, it's a little ambitious that the chip shortage will be fully cleared up, but maybe by 2025, maybe by 2025 it is. And that's when they're talking about starting to make these things. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. Just seems like a lot of guesswork, Tom. Seems like eh, a lot. Call me Pollyanna. <laughs> uh, here's who's not Pollyanna. Uh, Twitter, because they're <laughs> Twitter.com. It depends on who you follow. Well, yeah, it's true. All right. Maybe they're Pollyanna. At Pollyanna. Uh, uh, partnered uh, with uh, S&P Dow Jones uh, Indexes, Twitter is, to launch the S&P 500 Twitter Sentiment Index, which measures public sentiment of tweets about S&P 500 companies in real time. Tweets that use the company's cash tag, so the hashtag with the cash, um, the money sign in front of it, Twitter's way of indexing a company's ticker symbol like a hashtag will be analyzed. Filters will weed out spam and other attempts to skew results. And then a model trained on sentiment analysis will gauge the positivity or negativity of the tweet. The companies with the 200 highest sentiment uh, scores will be tracked in a performance index. And the sentiment select equal weight index will track the 50 highest sentiment scoring companies. Essentially, it's a meme stock index. Yeah, I, 
I will begin to try to guess if this is going to be of any use to any investor out there uh, or not. Maybe it will be, but I think it's a fascinating move for Twitter to say, you know what we can do with data that won't violate anybody's privacy? It isn't involved in third-party tracking, but can make us a lot of money because a big, big organization like S&P 500 will pay us for it. This kind of thing, little machine learning, little uh, AI analysis, and create a, a big thing. Uh, this may or may not be the thing, but I would expect Twitter to do more of this enterprise level data service stuff and until one of them sticks. Yeah, this uh, it, it sort of seemed strange to me, but the more I think about it, the more I think, okay, well, Let's say I was somebody who really cared, whether I worked at the company or not, who really cared about company X and how the public sentiment uh, is after, you know, there was an acquisition or something else happened. Well, you can kind of measure that using social networking tools already. But if Twitter can say, nah, nah, it's like so cumbersome, here's how we give you the real data. And that is extremely time sensitive. I can see where certain larger companies would take advantage of this. I'm not sure how, I mean, and again, we're, we're talking S and P stuff, but, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure how any smaller business would take advantage and how consumers would care about this much. Yeah. I don't know if consumers would care about it, but that's not the point here. What Twitter wants to do as, as Tom pointed out is create an enterprise level service that would be very expensive. The people that would be making money on it, uh, would pay for now whether or not it is of worth again is the biggest uh, the biggest point and this i think goes to the heart of what you said tom whether or not this is a future line of business for twitter is dependent on one core central idea is twitter representative of real life or is it much like camelot and uh, the the search for the holy grail a silly place that doesn't really represent <laughs> much of all it's just a loud gigantic nut house why would you care about who's arguing about uh, uh whatever figment of their imagination at the commissary table well but that's that's the pitch right sure twitter's not real life but you know who is on twitter a bunch of investors who influence uh, investing opinion maybe you know who else journalists like i could see some journalism sentiment index uh, it just, coming out it of just this, seems possibly. like Twitter data, has so many tools the, already for groups and lists and, you know, follows yeah, and hashtags and is, all of the things. This is data processing. This is yeah. this is not like, oh, I can see what's trending. This is like the the big, like, we will take millions of tweets and be able to tease out a trend that you couldn't tell just by looking. And that's the secret sauce that we're we're selling here. Yeah, imagine if you knew AMC before AMC started happening. Right. Imagine, yeah, like that. that yeah, that's yeah. the idea that you could catch the swell before anybody else. And, and in the world of finance, that does matter. It's not going to affect the Twitter trend, trending topic. Hey, folks, do you remember Wednesday? Remember Wednesday? Yeah, dude. Oh. Barely. Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday, literally because it was. Uh, that's when we talked about Amazon removing Visa credit cards as an option for purchases in the UK as of January 19th next year. And Sarah, do you remember when you said that was kind of weird because Amazon partners with Visa on credit cards in the US? I do, yeah. yeah. I still think well, it's weird. Well, apparently Amazon would like Sarah to hold their beer. Reuters reports that an Amazon spokesperson shortly after we did the show yesterday, I think, said that the company is in talks with MasterCard and American Express, as well as Visa, about who it will continue to partner with on their credit cards they issue in the United States in the future. Amazon's UK credit card is already issued with MasterCard. So they don't have Visa everywhere. Visa may not be everywhere Amazon wants to be. The UK removal announcement follows recent changes in Singapore and Australia, where Amazon hasn't removed Visa as a payment option, but will charge you an additional fee to pay with a Visa credit card. Those countries have caps on the amount that card issuers can charge merchants, by the way. The UK, freshly out of the European Union, no longer does. So last month, Visa raised the fees for credit card transactions between the UK and the EU from 0.3% to 1.5%. Although... MasterCard also raised its UK EU interchange fees recently. Amazon's picking the fight with Visa. Some people think that Amazon just wants to push folks to its own payment system, 
Uh, they used to have one. Now they have Amazon Pay, but it's really just backed with your account and your credit cards in there. So it's not exactly the same thing. So maybe they're going to launch something new. And Reuters points out that this is something that's happened before. Walmart Canada stopped taking Visa, for example, in about 20 stores in 2016, after which Visa and Walmart worked out a new agreement. And I think I don't know. That goes back to what Rich was saying yesterday. Is that this feels like, you know, when a TV station and a cable company get in fight in public over the negotiations, and maybe that's all this is. I I I, I really put ourselves in the situation of just humble villagers uh, who look upon Mount Olympus and, while there is thunder and lightning, wonder about the fights of the gods above, because that's really what this is. Amazon is a gigantic force, obviously, in e-commerce, if not the biggest force in e-commerce. Uh, Visa is uh, among a few privileged few that have allowed this element of digital uh, purchasing to exist at the level that it does. And when they get into fights, we are talking about probably billions of dollars, you know, and 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 how long uh, uh, these guys are going to to play chicken with each other uh, is is going to be interesting. But yeah, this is this is big boy stuff. This is this is like a, a, a GDP of nations level of, uh, of, of of fighting that happens between these kinds of brontosauruses. And yet, I feel like Visa and Amazon and Amazon and whatever other uh, financial services company it wants to fight with are going to come to a decision, and no one is going to have a whole lot of input on it. Otherwise, I have an Amazon Visa account. I live in the U.S. It works. If at some point Amazon's like, can't do it anymore, we figured out a great way for you to uh, switch over to MasterCard and had more or less the same rates and the same perks, okay, what am I going to do? Yeah. I, I just had a credit card switch from Visa to MasterCard. They, they, or, uh, no, the other way around. They went from MasterCard to Visa, and yeah. they just sent me new cards that had the Visa logo on it. It was even, I, I think it was a new number, but otherwise I didn't have to do anything. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, the fact that in the UK in January, you might not be able to use your Visa card to pay for Amazon is is a threat. And that's that's the line in the sand. Or like, you need to come to an agreement with us by then, or you're going to lose a bunch of money. I'm, I'm guessing you're right, Sarah. They're going to figure this out before then, however well, they figure it out. Or they won't. And, and they're they going won't. to see, all right, so are you going to deal with a bunch of angry customers? Are you yep. going to deal with the loss? You know data better than anybody. How many abandoned carts are going to happen before you realize that that Visa is something that, that it's a uh, game of chicken, indeed right? needs to be everywhere you want to be? Yeah. And meanwhile, Visa says, we are the world's payment system. We are not a vassal to any one of you vendors. You are a simple vendor, Amazon. Uh, you 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 play by our rules. We will negotiate a rate that is fair for us because if we cave to you, then when next do we cave to another gigantic super monster in this uh, 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 world of of credit card transactions that isn't just e-commerce, right? E-commerce with Walmart, is with Walmart card. Canada, they had to actually stop taking the cards in sixteen places before Visa was a, was willing to to compromise and come to an agreement. So you're right. Maybe maybe there'll be a month where you can't use a visa on the UK. Maybe it'll be it, longer. I don't know. It very much reminds me of of a, like a good episode of Succession. <laughs> They're going <laughs> full beast mode. Uh, hey, you have a thought about something on the show, but you don't know our email address? Let me fix that. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. The Verge's Maddie Stone postulates that Apple's change of heart on customer repair is because of a shareholder resolution filed in September. Apple recently created an independent repair provider program. That was the one that uh, had a problem with uh, changing the camera, and then Apple quickly fixed it so they could still change the camera. It makes parts and manuals more accessible to shops that don't want to go through the hurdles and payments needed to become Apple certified. Wednesday, Apple announced its new self-service repair program. We told you that right here on the show. Let's individuals who know what they're doing get parts and manuals to fix their stuff at home. Or at least a few things, M1 processors and a couple iPhones, but it'll expand. Coincidentally, Wednesday, not just the day they announced self-service repair, but also the deadline for a mutual fund company called Green Century to push forward on its shareholder resolution around repair practices. Green Century issued this resolution back in September, calling on Apple to reverse its anti-repair practices. On October 18th, Apple issued a no-action request in response to that resolution, 
telling the SEC that the proposal infringed on Apple's normal business operations, which was a violation of shareholder proposal guidance from the SEC. On November 3rd, the SEC updated its guidance to say, okay, but shareholder proposals that address day-to-day -day business issues are okay if they raise something of significant social impact. Now, they didn't say whether Green Century's resolution qualified or not, and to yesterday, Wednesday, November 17th, Apple announced the self-service repair program. And instead of pushing forward to find out if it qualified for the exemption, Green Century went, okay, that, that's actually pretty close to what we were asking for, and withdrew the right to repair resolution. Apple's Nick Leahy told The Verge that the new repair programs have been in development for more than a year, but that timing sure is convenient. And don't forget, the US FTC also released a report in May saying it found scant evidence to justify repair restrictions imposed by companies like Apple. So there are other pressures too, but still kind of crazy coincidence on the timing, don't you think? Uh, yeah, one might say there's no coincidence at all, which <laughs> you know, would be would be very interesting. Or that they're only at. literally coincident, but on purpose, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah, so we've got a lot of stories that involve Apple specifically around their app store practices that seem to be moving in a certain direction around payments and, and stuff like that. But Apple will not relent. They will not relent until they are forced into doing something because that is the Apple way. They have carved out their niche. They will follow their own guidance until the absolute last second. I think when we say, okay, well, what is the absolute last second? what Tom just described when it came to, to, to self-repair. That's how far Apple will go. That's how far you need to push Apple for things to change. Also, <laughs> the Apple spokesperson saying, the repair programs, we've been working on this for a while. That might be true. Sure. That's not totally the point of this. You, you could have said, well, you know, let, let's see how this is going. But the timing of the rollout is is very specific. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, I don't doubt that they are working on new payment processor systems. But uh, 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 even now, <laughs> even now, they're probably working on new payment process. And then when they do it, they'll be like, this has been a long time coming. It's been in the we pipeline. We're going to do this anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In 2025, yeah, sure. along with the car, <laughs> we're going to see a lot of stuff from Apple. Very convenient. Here's a headline for you. Axios reports that VP of Gaming Phil Schiller is advocating video game preservation through emulation. The problem is that older video games locked to out-of-date formats and consoles. Maybe you don't want to play these old games, but having them available has other benefits. Spencer said, quote, I think that we can learn from the history of how we got here through the creative, adding, I love it in music, I love it in movies and TV, and there's positive reasons for gaming to want to follow. In a DM, Axio says, Spencer said, quote, my hope, and I think I have to present it as that way as of now, is as an industry, we'd work on legal emulation that allowed modern hardware to run any, within reason, older executables allowing somebody to play the game. Now, there's a huge culture of using emulators to preserve games, but to actually run the games, you gotta violate the old copyright laws unless uh, the companies involved, like Nintendo, Sony, etc., wanna cooperate. Microsoft, for example, offers old games on Xbox and emulation, but it's limited. The ideal would be for companies to offer old game executables legally that could be used in multiple emulators. And Spencer seems to agree, saying, quote, in the end, if we said, hey, anybody should be able to buy any game or own any game and continue to play, that seems like a great North Star for us as an industry, end quote. Kyle Orlin at Ars Technica has an excellent discussion of why there are licensing issues that make this harder than it sounds. It takes more than just a company being willing. There's a complex web of who loans the, who owns the licenses to which games and which regions. Sometimes the owner is out of business and the legal rights are in question, meaning... Nobody can approve them. Yeah, that, that's a great read over at Ars Technica. And I, I don't think it it uh, disproves what, what Spencer is saying or tries to undermine him. In fact, I, I think Orlin goes out of the way to say, hey, he's saying all the right things, but it's harder than it sounds. Uh, it's it's important for Spencer, uh, or, or Schiller rather, uh, to, to, act, to go out there and say, 
let's uh, you know, let, let's make this our effort. Let, let's spearhead it. It's a big effort. And we'll see if if he's actually able to to get the industry to follow up on it, because it's not just willingness. It's one thing for Schiller to get out there and say, yes, let's get everybody on the same page. Come on, Nintendo. Come on, Sony. These old games. Let's do it for preservation. Let's do it for research. Let's do it for the culture. Uh, and maybe he can get that done. But even if all of them want to do it, there's well, wait. Sony has this game, but they only have the rights to run it on on the PS2 hardware itself. Yeah, they can't even run it on the PS3 or the PS4. So how do we deal with that? Oh well, let's go to the right holder. Oh well, that rights holder no longer exists, or it's a patent holding company that wants an outrageous amount of money uh, yeah. for the rights to it. Uh, there's there's just so many issues there that that make it complicated to work out. That doesn't mean it's Im- impossible uh, or not worth trying, but. It is, it is more than just getting Schiller and, and a few people to, to finally get the industry to change its mind, right? Uh, can I play one cynical point? Isn't it yeah, interesting yeah. that Apple, you know, a company that primarily makes iPhones and Apple TVs where you could sit, play simple games and, and uh, uh, you know, interact with them, that they're the ones who want to do it for the culture? Come on, guys. Let's, let's get our history out there. Sure, it would involve a lot of people being able to maybe play games on emulators on Apple TVs and iPhones, but, but it's for the culture. But it's, it's Microsoft saying it, right? Uh, oh, wait, sorry. I thought it was uh, uh, my bad. Yeah. 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 It's, it, so it's, take, it's, take back that take. It's uh, Phil Spencer. We, we keep saying Schiller. I kept saying Schiller. It yeah. says Schiller here. It's Phil Spencer. You said Spencer. Spencer is right. That's the it, confusion. I said both. I, it, yeah, I regret both the, the error. Yeah. Uh, but we're, yeah, we're talking about Microsoft here. Got you. Phil Spencer. Uh, yeah. All right, let's check out the mailbag. <laughs> Phil Schiller is like, what did I ever do to you guys? Schiller's like, I, I don't want that. No. <laughs> like that. Nick wrote in, hello, Nick. Uh, Nick is a frequent emailer, and we love your emails, Nick. Nick says, regarding the Facebook meta development of force feedback gloves for VR, which we talked about on yesterday's show, Nick says, the first thing that came to mind is the safety of my fingers and hands. As a sim racer with a... Fen- f- Fanatec DD1 at direct drive wheelbase. I'm very aware of the safety of force feedback motors and their interaction with human hands. When you calibrate the force feedback of a sim racing wheel to be safe and within your capabilities, it's normally safe. But if you have something go wrong with the software or logic controlling the hardware, it's exactly the wrong way a wheel can spin out of control, break bones, tear muscles or ligaments. That's wow. why kill switches are highly recommended for sim racing equipment. Before I put my hands on any force feedback glove, I really want to know what safety features are included because if things go wrong, they can go very wrong. Yeah, I, I, I like this note because Nick's not saying he doesn't want the force feedback glove. He's saying, great, sounds wonderful. Uh, and I know it's real early, but can you make sure it's not going to break my fingers if I stick my hand in? And I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can design it that way. Just really would like to know. That that uh, that element of it before I before I get out there and and try out one of these. Well, thanks to everybody who sends in feedback. We love your feedback. Do keep it coming. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that feedback. We also have a couple new brand new bosses that we'd like to thank today. Neil Shaver and Todd Nolan just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Todd. King of thank men. you. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 I, uh, in, in the new editor's desk today, I, I talked about uh, emails and how we select emails. Uh, read a little bit from Sarah about that uh, and and mentioned that the patrons are the backbone of, of what we're doing right now with all the, the crazy economy out there uh, that, that causes the ad industry to kind of flood one way or another. It's it's really nice to know that that we've got you all in there. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Also, thanks to Justin Robert Young for being with us on the show today. Justin, what's been going on in the last week? Oh, you know, in the political world, it is always swirling. Here in the great state of Texas, Beto O'Rourke has announced that he is running for governor. How is it going to be different from his nearly successful 2018 campaign? How is he different from his failed presidential campaign? Find out in the episode that we released this Wednesday on PX3. Excellent. Well, we are live on this show, Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. Put it on your calendar. Join us if you can. And find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Tomorrow, Rich and I will be joined by Rob Dunwood and Len Peralta. 
Don't miss it. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>